Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning. Welcome to this week's edition of Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Craig Van Sant. I teach at the University of Northern Iowa and hold the David W. Wilson Chair in Business Ethics there. This week's edition is going to talk about the criteria by which we decide who does and who should immigrate to the United States. Immigration reform has been a hot topic in our nation's capital for many years now. Under the current administration, it has become an even more volatile topic. President Trump ran his campaign in part on building a wall across the southern border of the United States. Shortly after taking office, he tried to ban travel from several different Muslim-dominated countries. Uh, he then declared the end of the DACA program by which many so-called dreamers could actually be deported to their home countries which they have no affiliation with. And most recently he has been talking about a caravan of Latin Americans walking towards the United States seeking asylum and talking about what potential terrorist, threat, terrorist threats they represent. In this week's edition, we'll review the current laws governing immigration. We'll talk about current trends and patterns and try to come to some decision about what the proper criteria are for determining immigration. To help us with this inquiry, we're lucky to have with us John McCurley, who is an oral and public historian with the University of Iowa. John, really appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you for having me. And our other panelist is Ray Sheets, an immigration attorney with the law firm of Raphael M. Sheets here in Cedar Rapids. Ray, thanks for coming and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Good. Appreciate both of you being here. Being a, quote, nation of immigrants, the United States has had to grapple with methods of controlling immigration since its very founding. If we think of immigration as a continuum with completely open doors and open arms at one end and with completely closed doors to potential immigrants at the other end, I think our first order of business is trying to figure out where we are on that scale. So Ray, I want to turn to you as an immigration attorney and ask you a totally unfair question. Can you briefly summarize the immigration laws we have in the United States today? Uh, no, not briefly. <laughs> um, I can try. Um, so our immigration laws promote a couple different things. Uh, the first thing it promotes is to uh, bringing families together. So if a uh, U.S. citizen wants to petition for their foreign-born spouse, that's, uh, that citizen has the right to do that. Once that foreign-born spouse comes to the United States and maybe he or she has children from a prior relationship uh, that are under the age of 21, they can come as well. Okay. Once that uh, foreign-born spouse uh, becomes a green card holder or becomes a legal permanent resident of the United States, they eventually can become a U.S. citizen. They have to be a U.S. Uh, permanent resident for every situation is different, between three to five years. Okay. Once they become a U.S. citizen, they can file uh, petitions for their parents. Uh, they can file petitions for their siblings. Um, they can file uh, petitions for their adult children, if they have any. So there's a large area of immigration law that encourages um, family unification. Okay. Second area of the immigration law uh, encourages 
uh, highly skilled workers to come to the United States and be in the employ of U.S. companies. Uh, the most common uh, type of non-immigrant visa that uh, allows this is called an H-1B visa. An H-1B visa, there are 65,000 a year that are given, and they are given to those uh, immigrants who have, uh, to those foreign-born persons that are, have at least have a college education, and will be coming to the United States to do a uh, highly skilled position. So that foreign-born person cannot uh, come to the U.S. and do a job that does not require a college degree. Okay. Um, that foreign-born person can't uh, be an accountant, have an accountant uh, degree, and then come and work as a uh, uh, some some other area outside of their uh, background. So there's 65,000 of those that are allowed each year, and they they uh, are generally used within a day or two of becoming available. Wow. And they become available October one of each year. Okay. So as of October 30th today, there aren't any more of those left. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of the open arms, uh, how you described it, there are certain uh, other uh, ways. Um, asylum is a way uh, that people can uh, stay legally in the United States. But I have to say that is quite difficult uh, to overcome. Um, simply because one comes from a country that um, is generally oppressive or has a poor economic uh, system that doesn't qualify. There has to be some specific persecution that they've suffered because of their religion, because of their sexuality, because of their political um, leanings. So that is an avenue uh, towards our open arms uh, uh, policy. Uh, refugees is, is very closely associated with the, the Siles. Um, there are other ways. Um, uh, another common one is to invest in an American company that will hire American workers. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room with that, but generally a person, a foreign born person has to invest at least a million dollars into a company and show that that investment in that company is going to hire a number of American workers. Um, I, I must say that uh, the employment uh, ways of coming to the United States is becoming more difficult. Um, the Trump administration has very strongly encouraged the hiring of Americans. And along with that, uh, there has become a much more highly uh, the uh, employment type of visas are becoming much more highly scrutinized okay. by our by the uh, the Trump administration. So even though those uh, types of visas are available, it's becoming more and more difficult uh, for foreign-born persons to get uh, those kinds of employment visas. So generally, those three are: family, employment, and then as you described the open arms okay. uh, part of our, our laws. And you were mentioning to me before we started the show that you brought a couple yeah. of books. I brought some yeah. props with me today. Uh, this, so this here is uh, the book on federal immigration laws and regulations. And this book is about 2,500 pages of oh. very small print. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say, very fine print. Yeah, and so this is a, uh, a good a way of showing how complicated the immigration laws are. And so we have this 2,500-page book. Okay, and and along, I'm sure you've memorized every word in there. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, no. Um, I wish, but no. And then to go along with this uh, book that just deals with our federal immigration laws and regulations, we have a, another 3,000 page book that attempts to explain what is in that book. So, okay. um, you know, it's often been described, immigration law in the U.S. has often been described 
uh, as complicated as our tax laws. And so uh, the tax code and the immigration code, I think, are uh, as equally complicated and complex. Uh, so. And I know how much I hate doing my own taxes. I can imagine what that's like. And that's, a, you know, that's an example of, uh, you know, I, I, I represent primarily American citizens petitioning for foreign-born spouses or, um, uh, you know, foreign-born family members. And they always say, well, do you think I can do, do, you think I can do it myself? Uh, do you think you can, uh, or do I need a lawyer? And my response is, well, you know, I ask that same question during tax time. <laughs> and I always have somebody that helps me. Sure. And so, yes, um, just by looking at what those books show, get a lawyer. Very complicated. John, let me shift to you for a little bit. You've been very involved in interviewing current immigrants and refugees, primarily who work at the meatpacking industry. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit about your interviews with them? What, what are immigrants looking for when they come here? Why are they, why are they leaving their home countries? Uh, that's, so, so yeah, so I work for the University of Iowa Labor Center, uh, where I've conducted uh, interviews as part of something called the Iowa Labor History Oral Project. It's a, it's a large project uh, started by the Iowa Labor Movement 40 years ago, and continues today, um, <coughs> and, and looking at the changes that have happened, uh, including um, the recent waves of, of new immigrants and refugees. Um, and what I would say is, is that Immigrant workers are looking for exactly the same things that that all workers are looking for, right? You know, is um, is security, is opportunity. There's really very little difference when you talk to people about the kinds of things that they uh, strive for and the kinds of things that um, anyone born here uh, would strive for. Well, this again may be an unfair question, but. My presumption is that most people would prefer to stay somewhere close to where they were born. I find, a, find it difficult to think about emigrating to another country. Um, what drives people away from their home countries? Uh, it's a variety of things, depending upon the circumstance. So it's, uh, it's sometimes it's economic hardship. Uh, sometimes it's um, desire for something new and an opportunity that they don't have where they're living. Uh, sometimes it's civil war. Uh, sometimes it's the, the state of being stateless. So, so for example, um, I've uh, interviewed refugees uh, who, whose families are from uh, Burma or, or Myanmar. Um, but who grew up in, uh, in refugee camps in Thailand, right? So uh, their families have fled uh, for various reasons, the ruling regime in, in Burma, Myanmar, and so they end up in these refugee camps. Well, the, the Thai uh, government doesn't uh, allow them outside of these refugee camps. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, so again, these are, these are people who would spend their, their lives essentially in these, these small uh, encampments with very little opportunity. Um, and so they find themselves sometimes uh, sneaking out of the camps in order to, to go to, to Thai uh, cities in mm -hmm. order to, to find opportunity. Um, or in some cases, uh, leaving to go to other nearby countries where they then sometimes become uh, essentially what we would call undocumented workers. Um, and then uh, sometimes finding refugee status where they, they move all around the world. But they, um, people find themselves in, in often in intolerable circumstances that they're trying to escape. Okay. Well, let me open the floor to both of you. Um, in doing some research in preparation for this show, I, you know, did some general reading about the thoughts on immigration in the United States today, and it, it seemed to me that the concerns that most people have fall into two categories. That immigrants may take jobs that U.S. citizens could have had, and the other one being that U.S. citizens end up paying for social benefits that the immigrants have access to and concern that we end up paying 
more than we get from immigrants. Um, would either of you like to comment on that? Well, regarding your first point, uh, do foreign-born persons take jobs of U.S. citizens? In my experience, it's actually been the opposite is true. Foreign-born workers take the jobs that American citizens don't want um, and within our state, the state of Iowa. If I had a dollar for every time a farmer called me and said, <clears throat> we have this worker, uh, he's not from the United States, we want to do everything we can to keep him, he shows up on time, he works his tail off, um, he doesn't uh, cause us any problems, uh, but he's not allowed to work. What can we do? Because we can't find any American citizens that are comparable to this worker. And unfortunately, you have to tell that farmer or dairy farmer, uh, there's not a lot you can do. So in my experience, um, it's the actual opposite is true. Uh, the, the foreign born workers are taking jobs that American citizens don't want. Okay. And, and, I, and I, I would agree, I would say that both of those propositions are false. Um, so just to, an, another historical example here is that, uh, so meatpacking, for example, in the state is one place where you find a lot of immigrant and refugee workers. Well, those, the vast majority uh, of those immigrant and refugee workers came since the late 1980s, in the, eight, in the late 1980s and 1990s. Well, it's important to remember what happened to meatpacking work in the 1980s, right, in which we had a period of essentially what we might call meatpacking wars, in which uh, meatpacking employers, quite frankly, waged war on union workers. Um, and, in the, and in the span of just a few years, you had jobs that then at the time paid $10.69 an hour, had the, those, those same wages uh, cut in half to, to $5, uh, just in the span between, say, 1986 and 1988. Um, and in the wake of that, um, you had workers who, uh, who didn't want to work uh, for that work that, uh, in, in those conditions that were uh, then suddenly non-union, um, that were still dirty and dangerous, and that were suddenly worth only half as much. And so anyone who had it in, uh, some sort of out um, often took it. Um, there were other native-born workers who stayed in and said, you know, we, I'm going to try to make the best of this. Um, some folks didn't have uh, a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then there were some people who said, you know, I'm going to stay and fight and, and rebuild my union. Um, and then there were workers who came into that who were, uh, who were foreign born, um, often recruited by uh, these same employers who were interested in uh, continuing to run their businesses, of course, but at $5 an hour instead of $10.69 an hour. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is, is that it wasn't foreign born workers who came in and then the wages went down, it was the employers pulled down the wages, and then they recruited foreign-born workers. Okay. Um, paint, you both are painting a very different picture than the concerns that I've heard. Um, what little research I've done about the economic contributions that immigrant workers provide versus what they cost us in terms of social benefits and education is also that the reality is they contribute more to the American economy than they take. You're nodding, John. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely true. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, and I, I don't, I'll, I'll make this very quick, which is that, I mean, of course, the truth is that compared to most industrialized societies, the United States provides paltry benefits to its, to its, uh, uh, to its citizens, to, it, to its residents. Um, and, and, and so in the case of foreign-born workers, they are often contributing tremendously in the form of uh, of sales taxes, say for example. Um, even the undocumented are oftentimes paying into things like Social Security. Uh, and so the truth is, is that they, they generate vastly more wealth, um, often wealth that they themselves do not see, um, and, uh, and, and, and for which we should, we should recognize them. Okay. Well, so let's turn to the question I talked about to start with. The criteria by which we should allow immigrants or keep immigrants out. Um, Ray, you did, I thought, a very good job of explaining current law, 
um, as briefly as you could. How would you go about redesigning immigration law in terms of bringing in the people that we think we should bring in? Wow, <clears throat> that's even a more difficult question than your first question. What should, how should the laws change? Um, and let me interrupt yeah. and maybe give you another second to think. Well, I, I, the, the most, the, the clearest example of what laws should change, you mentioned the DACA, the Dream Act uh, kids. Uh, you know, they came here with their parents when they were very, very young, um, usually smuggled across uh, by their family members. And they've gone to school, they've um, learned, of course, England, English, they've totally assimilated themselves to American culture. And, you know, when they go and attempt to get a driver's license, uh, they realize that, wow, um, I can't get a lot of things that my friends can get. And then it becomes, I'm not, they find out that I'm not even supposed to be here. And so when you visit with those uh, people, and I've visited with many, many, and I've represented many, um, you realize that through no fault of their own, um, they are being punished. And when I say they're being punished, um, you know, some of them are arrested and deported. Um, but others uh, just have that cloud that continues to be over them all the time. What happens if I have to go back to wherever they came from, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, and I don't know anybody, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know where I would live, I, where I would go, where I would work. That has to be like a real heavy um, thing on their shoulders all the time. And so the, the one thing that I, that I see that I, sh that I think to myself, wow, this really needs to be changed, is something along those lines about, you know, those kids that, you know, they're, they're being punished for the sins of their parents, almost. Right. Um, Which, if I remember right, was one of the things that the United States was founded on was getting away from English law that did allow children to be punished for their parents' misdeeds. Yeah, but you have to you have to balance that with there is we 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 must have some respect for the law. Sure. Um, and so the current law is is that these what were then children are now adults. How does one take care of them, or how does one fit their situation into a something that that we can do to help them? And so. Hopefully something will change. Um, they've been talking about changing it for many, many years and nothing really has happened. Mm -hmm. But that's one uh, glaring example, I think, about how I would change the law, I mean, okay. um, in terms of dealing with that population. Okay. John, let me give that same question to you. Ray talked about what is called chain migration with family. We've got the H-1B visa program to bring in skilled workers and then lumping everything else in together, kind of the refugee thing. Do you see shifting emphasis? Uh, well, uh, so I'm a historian, um, so I'll try, to, I'll try to approach it as an historian. So uh, you know, if you look at uh, the total numbers of, of foreign-born uh, people coming to the United States, if you just look simply at numbers, uh, it seems like this massive explosion, this unprecedented explosion. But the reality is, is that if you look at a percentage of population, that same number is actually quite a bit within historic norms. <coughs> so if, you, if you look back uh, to the late 19th and the early 20th century before the first um, massive wave of, um, of restriction that happens in the 1920s, uh, at least for European immigrants, uh, that uh, it, it were well within historic norms in the 19th century. Um, and, and 
And again, the truth is, is that for the vast majority of, of Iowans, uh, uh, our, our relatives came, our grandparents, great grandparents, uh, under under in that system, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, they, and they came via, what, again, what is often disparaged today as chain migration, but that, that, that was, what, what was what has been called in most of American immigration history simply immigration, uh, uh, or migration, I should say. Okay. People, people, one person, say, going uh, as, a, as, a, as a pioneer, let's, let's use that word maybe, and, uh, and then having families uh, and loved ones come and join them later. Um, that, that has been the primary method of, of movement uh, for virtually all of American history. And if my family and my wife's family is any indication, that's usually spoken of in very proud terms. That Uncle Charlie came over with two dollars in his pocket and built up and brought the rest of the family over. Um, so Canada has officially gone more towards the merit program a lot of people are talking about that. Um, we're running short on time, but do either of you uh, support Canada's idea as opposed to family? I'm not familiar with Canada's idea. Okay. It's tough enough to follow <laughs> the U.S. Uh, ideas. Good point. John, you... I'm, I'm loosely familiar with it. Uh, as I understand it, 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 it it's a system that, high, that, that benefits highly skilled workers. Uh, I'm... Again, I'm 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 not an attorney. I'm not a, uh, so I I I don't want to get into the into into the details of the law. Um, but but again, as a historian, what I would say is is that uh, is that again, we as a as a nation um, have 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 weathered this before, and we are at our best when we are welcoming and when we see ourselves in others, when we see our own experience. Our experience as people who have uh, have ourselves migrated, um, and to see ourselves in the people who are joining us today as our neighbors, um, I think that's when we're at our best. Okay. Well, I know we're running short on time. Um, let me just note that as as we close today's episode, it, this is a major concern in the United States, the whole subject of immigration. Um, we have President Trump now talking about the possibility of changing citizenship laws so that individuals born in the United States do not automatically become citizens. We have people talking about the threat that immigration from our, southern, from our southern neighbors is threatening the United States. This is a subject that I think it makes sense for all of us to give deeper thought to. As Ray talked about, it is a very complicated subject. As John talked about, you know, the immigrants are not waves of strange people. They are individuals just like we are. On behalf of the Lynn County Interregional Interreligious Council, I'd like to thank both of you very much for appearing and giving us benefit of your knowledge. And viewers, I'd like you to thank I'd like to thank you for watching. Have a great week.